go. Okay, um, so thanks uh, everyone for tuning in. So uh, this week we're very happy to have Gabor Sorosi um, from UPenn and or uh, Brussels uh, who's gonna tell us about his latest work on complexity in the bulk volume. Um, so uh, Gabor, thank you very much and uh, we'll let you know if we have any questions. Okay, uh, thank you very much for having me. It's my first uh, virtual time in Potsdam. Um, so I'm go going to talk about uh, work that I've done uh, over the summer and uh, something that appeared just uh, recently with Alex Berinanait or Lavkovitz. Uh, so the motivation um, for this work originally came from thinking about uh, what are classical states in the bulk. Um, so basically what are generally the bulk coherent states, uh, parameterize some initial data H and K. Uh, and can we understand something about their overlaps beyond the uh, effective field theory? Um, and so one of the sort of questions that uh, could be asked if you understand these overlaps is that uh, what are the wave functions of some certain states? Are they peaked? How classical uh, they are? And uh, there's a good candidate for these co coherent states uh, in the CFT. So, so these are states that are created by the Euclidean path integral in a very similar way as you create a vacuum. So you create the va vacuum wave function by doing the Euclidean path integral on half of the Euclidean manifold uh, and putting some boundary condition on the edge. And you can generalize this by turning on some sources for operators uh, on this half side. So this way you get a parameterized set of states uh, which are parameterized by these lambda sources on a half side. Okay, so how does this connect to holography? So if you want to calculate the norm of such a state, then basically what you're doing is a path integral on the entire boundary, where you copy, the copy and reflect the conjugate of the sources on the top half. So this way you're doing a path integral with complete sources. And using the standard dictionary, there's some Euclidean saddle inside. Um, and the proposal of Skanderis and Van Ries is that this is the dual geometry for this state. Um, and in particular, there are sometimes, usually there's some slice which you can continue nicely to Lorentzian and read some initial data associated to, to these sources. So this, this is the outline of the proposed mapping between uh, initial data and, uh, and these sources. This leads to, if these things are conjugate, this leads to re real Lorentzian initial data. And if you want states in the CFT, you want to turn off these sources near the t equals zero slice. So you can show that around the vacuum, uh, in effective field theory, these states are really um, coherent states of the effective field theory. Um, and just from a broader field theory perspective, you can also think about these states as uh, the vacuum of a deformed theory, in particular if you, uh, these sources don't depend on the Euclidean time then this is indeed just how you prepare the vacuum of a theory that you deform by this source. Okay, so, so the plan of today is uh, that in the first half, I will explain uh, um, the correspondence between a geometry that you can define on the space of these sources that parameterize these states. So this geometry comes from uh, partially from the Fubini study metric and uh, the Berry curvature on, on this set of states. And this geometry corresponds to uh, the symplectic structure in the bulk uh, along with the quantum polarization. So how you separate these coordinates, phase space coordinates into uh, momenta and coordinates for quantization. So this will be the first half of the talk. Um, and in the second half, I will try to use this correspondence to understand um, things about the maximal volume. So the way this will, roughly work is that uh, the variation of the volume of the maxima slice you can always write in the bulk as a symplectic pairing between the given variation and something fixed which is in the bulk uh, a deformation that is conjugate to the volume so i will explain what this is from the bulk point of view uh, how to understand it uh, but the ultimate goal is to understand the boundary version of this so there will be some deformation of the boundary sources that is conjugate to the volume and we want to understand what this guy is um, and so one proposal that came out of uh, comes out of this uh, by studying this deformation uh, is something that connects to 
hopefully to complexity. Um, so from the scalar structure on these sources, you can define some notion of distance between these classical states. Um, and you can regard this uh, distance as a sort of complexity, which kind of uh, quantifies like how difficult to prepare, let's say one part integral state from the other. Um, and I will discuss some evidence that this, uh, this distance uh, might be related to the to this volume of the extremal slice. Okay, so let me begin. So let's start with the Fubini study metric. So this is something that comes from uh, the overlap uh, when you kind of pull it back to the space of rays, so to the projective Hilbert space. So this is something that doesn't care about the normalization of a state. This is a natural metric there. Uh, and what we want to do is we want to think about some parametrized family of states, which you parameterize by some complex manifold. So by complex manifold, I just mean that you separate some, it's even dimensional and you can separate the coordinates into holomorphic and anti-holomorphic ones. Uh, and we want to study these uh, states and how the Fubini study metric looks here. Uh, and we want to embed these states in a way that this complex structure is compatible with the inner product. Um, so basically one way to achieve this is to just require this embedding to be holomorphic, which practically means that, uh, that cat states uh, don't depend on the anti-holomorphic coordinates. And if you conjugate them on the Hilbert space, you get bra states and then those don't depend on the holomorphic coordinates. Uh, so you can pull back this Fubini study metric and what you find is that it's a Kähler metric. So you have some second derivative of some scalar potential and this scalar potential is the log of the norm of this state. So by this condition, these states are necessarily unnormalized. So this will be some function of alpha and alpha star. Okay, so a scalar manifold generically comes with, uh, so, so it's a complex manifold, which means that it has a, a separation to holomorphic and anti-holomorphic coordinates. It also has a scalar potential which determines two structures, the metric, which I just wrote, and uh, another thing, which is the Kähler form, uh, which is compatible with the complex structure, which means that basically you can go between these two things with the complex structures. Only two of these objects are independent. So because of this, we automatically have a Kähler form, and this Kähler form is just obtained by taking these two form from the Kähler potential, uh, and the physical interpretation of this scalar form is that it's basically the Berry curvature two form on this set of states. So if you calculate the usual Berry connection for the normalized version of these states, you can express it with this scalar potential. And uh, this omega is really just the, the curvature two form of this connection. Okay, so how does this work in a simple example? So Let's just think about a harmonic oscillator and coherent states for this oscillator. So if you consider uh, coherent states that are unnormalized, they satisfy this holomorphicity constraint. And you can calculate the norm. It has some simple expression. So because of this, the Kähler potential is really just this norm squared of this complex number. Uh, and the Kähler form will be given by this expression and uh, written in terms of real coordinates is just the usual symplectic form of the oscillator. So this, you can think about this procedure as a de dequantization, like how you go back from some set of coherent states to the phase space structures. So now we want to apply this to quantum field theory. So in quantum field theory, as I said, I want to think about these uh, states created by the Euclidean path integral. Um, so I will think about the sources, these half-sided sources as these coordinates on a complex manifold, if you complexify them. And uh, the sources for the cat state will be the holomorphic coordinates and the ones for the brass states too, will be the anti-holomorphic coordinates. And I will use this notation where I put a minus for things that live on the bottom and the plus for things that live on the top. And it also just means that these are the holomorphic and these are the anti-holomorphic ones. So these are really complex conjugates. So the Kähler potential in quantum field theory uh, will be given 
so this overlap is just given by the total path integral. So this is just the partition function with some given set of sources that I will denote by lambda. And this lambda is just that I put the lambda minus on the bottom and the lambda plus on the top. Okay, so it's a, not an arbitrary source in this generating function, but something that has an extra symmetry. So it has a reflection plus co complex conjugation symmetry. Okay, so then what are these objects that I defined in quantum field theory? So because the K, both the Kähler metric and the Kähler form are second variations of this partition function, they will be governed by the connected two-point function in the given background. So this is, for example, how the Kähler form looks like. So the matrix elements are given by this two-point function. Um, so just collecting like one of the integrals into a linear response, you can write this in a more local form. So it looks like this. So this formula basically tells you that uh, in this sense, sources and, and the one-point functions are canonically conjugate. So notice that here, this integral just goes on one half of the Euclidean manifold, and these variations are on different sides. Okay, so let me move on uh, to connect this story to holography. But be before I do that, I want to remind you about how um, symplectic covariant symplectic structures work in uh, in a field theory, including general relativity. So this is Wald's formalism. So this is just a direct generalization of what you do in classical mechanics. So in classical mechanics, uh, if you take a variation of the Lagrangian, what you get is an equation, the equation of motion, plus you always get a boundary term. And what this boundary term is, is just PDQ. So it's the pre-symplectic form. And the way you get the symplectic structure from this is just you take an extra exterior derivative. And from this Hamilton's equation basically uh, reads us that the variation of a charge is given by pulling up the index of a flow, uh, dualizing it with the symplectic form. Okay, so the same game in classical field theory reads as that you now you have a Lagrangian density. So the variation of this gives you again the equations of motion. And now you get a boundary term. So this boundary term is enclosed by this uh, form theta, which is a co-dimension one of form. Uh, and the way, so, so this is your pre-symplectic structure and the way you get your symplectic form density is that you take an exterior derivative in field space. So in terms of variation, that means that you do an anti-symmetrized anti double variation here. Uh, and if you integrate this density on a Cauchy slice, you get the symplectic form in, uh, in field space, in the variation, uh, in the, like the tangent space to field space. And the way Watt defines conserved charges is just a direct analog of Hamilton's equation. You have some flow in field space and you pull up the index with the symplectic form. Okay, uh, you guys are still there, just like checking? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so uh, then let's apply um, <clears throat> using this Waltz techniques um, to holography and see how, how these objects, this scalar form and scalar uh, potential look like. So the killer potential, as I said, is just the log of the partition function. So the standard dictionary tells us that to reading order in large n, this is given by the onshore gravitational action with uh, the sources giving boundary conditions for the fields. So because of this, if you take a variation of this killer potential, uh, what you get, because it's on shell, what you get is only the boundary term, this theta, integrated uh, over the boundary of the bulk manifold. Okay, so this guy is linear in the variation. So because of this, if you do a strictly holomorphic or anti-holomorphic variation, what happens is that this, this guy is zero on one side of the Euclidean manifold of the, the boundary. Uh, so all that does is localizes this integral to one side of the, if you think about a the sphere, then one side of the sphere. So the holomorphic guy will be integrated only on the bottom, the anti-holomorphic will be integrated only on the top. So using this, you can derive the KLR2 form. So this, this is just the definition. So this was the formula. And what you can do is the, you, you can move the anti-holomorphic variations to the right, 
so this you can always do. And then the variations that are on the left, you add the complement anti-holomorphic variation. So you can do this for free because they fall out from anti-symmetrization. So because of this, you get the complete variations on the outsides. But I just told you that uh, on the inside, these guys, what they do is only that they localize this data on one side of the, of the Euclidean boundary. So because of this, what you get is that uh, you have the total variations here uh, over the total boundary, just integrated over half side. And this is just here the definition of this uh, symplectic flux <laughs> in the bulk. So what you get is, uh, uh, is an integral on, of this symplectic flux on half of the Euclidean manifold. Okay, so here, here is this in picture. So if you have a sphere, then this is where you integrate this symplectic flux. Okay, so now the interesting thing is that you can push this into the bulk because the symplectic flux is conserved whenever these variations are, so whenever this guy is on the shell, so it's nonlinear equations of motions and these variations solve the linearized equations of motions around this background. So, you know, this way you just get this saddle here of um, Costas, Skanderis and Juan Rees. Um, and we know how to solve for the linear variations in a given background. If we know the Euclidean boundary to bulk propagator, then we just uh, integrate the sources in with it. So because of this, these variations will have some expression, which is uh, some linear combination of holomorphic and anti-holomorphic sources with some kernels here. Okay, so g given that we understand what are the bulk objects uh, here. We can just like push this expression to wherever we want in Euclidean. Okay, of course the aim now is to see if we can relate this to the Lorentzian symplectic structure. For this we need uh, to find a slice where we can do a nice analytic continuation. So one case where this is easy to understand is the case when the sources are real. So this is some special case where lambda plus equals lambda minus. So in this case, in the ball, you have a Z2 symmetry because you just reflect the sources from the bottom to the top. Uh, and so this symmetry in the bulk, um, you can look for a slice that is fixed by this symmetry, this reflection. And on this slice, by construction, all the momenta, which are related to time derivatives have to be zero because they flip sign under this, uh, this operation. So there is no canonical momentum, there's no extrinsic curvature on this slice. So because of this, this slice continues nicely to Lorentzian because the Lorentzian continuation, uh, what it means is that basically we, 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 we multiply the momentum with an I. So that's how we go to Lorentzian initial data. Um, so for the variations, uh, this again works, you just use that the propagator in the background has to satisfy also this reflection symmetry and this way you can collect these integrals to a single side and you will see that uh, the coordinate will be related to the real part and uh, the momentum will be related to the imaginary part of, uh, of these sources. So basically you see that you get some lo real Lorentzian initial data variations. So these are Lorentzian initial data, and these are real precisely if lambda plus variation is conjugate to the lambda minus variation. Okay, so where do we push the symplectic form where, when the sources are not real? So, so this is a little bit less clear because now you need to uh, deal with some analytically continued uh, complex geometry in the bulk but there's still a symmetry. So if, if you flip in the sources in the boundary and you do a complex conjugation, uh, then you did nothing. So if you find a slice that is invariant under this symmetry, then because coordinates are, do not change under the Z2 flip, uh, they must be real. And the momenta, because they pick up a sign, they must be imaginary that this sign is undone by the complex conjugation. So on this slice, you, you have these relations for coordinates and momenta. So this is basically good Lorentzian initial data. So without doing a continuation on these slices, you have Lorentzian initial data. 
Um, and you can say the same thing about the variations. So if you assume that the uh, boundary to bulk propagator also obeys this Z2 plus C symmetry, which it should, then uh, again, it will be true that you can collect things in the variations and uh, they will give real Lorentzian initial data variations on this slice, given that the source variations are conjugate to each other. Okay, so let me say a word uh, or two about the other structures beyond the symplectic form. Um, so the complex structure, what it does is basically it, um, it's a notion of multiplication with I, and uh, you multiply holomorphic coordinates with I, then you multiply anti-holomorphic coordinates with minus I, the conjugate, and this is how it, you separate them into two groups. Um, and this is really just coming here, in this case, from the inner product in the CFT. So this is how it acts on the sources. It's very simple. In terms of the complete boundary condition, basically what it does, it multiplies with a sine function in Euclidean. But this is pretty complicated in the bulk, because remember the way you get the bulk variations is, uh, is some, there are some integral kernels from these sources. And if you flip that sign, uh, that's, that's some non-local action on these sources. But we can uh, kind of get a feel of what this is doing by looking at the, the Kähler norm of a variation. So here now this G is the Kähler metric. And the way you get this Kähler metric is that in the symplectic form, you, in one of the slots, you plug this complex structure. And if you just write this out, basically what you get is the bulk symplectic form where one of the variations is, so, so there is some projected variation, so that's what this minus means, and in the other set slot you have the conjugate of this. Uh, and this projected variation, what this is, is that um, you're forgetting about one of the sides of the sphere, so you switch off the source and you're sourcing this only from one side. Um, so this expression with the symplectic form with the conjugates is just the standard Klein-Gordon norm in the bulk. Uh, of field variations, and since this guy is positive, um, we we can have an idea of what this projection means. Um, so it should mean, mean projection to positive energy modes, because when you do quantum filtering curved space, uh, that's the the space on which the Klein-Gordon norm is positive definite. Uh, so so this suggests a connection between positive energy modes and negative Euclidean times. Um, which can be explicitly checked in, in perturbations around the vacuum. So that, that is something that follows from this work. Um, but this suggests that this notion in ADS at least uh, prevails even if there's no global time-like killing vector. Okay, so one simple example. Um, or simple consistency check, sanity check that one can run is to recover the conserved charges of the world. So you can think about turning on a conserved charge as a, as a transformation of the state by sourcing some imaginary sources. If you want some unitary transformation that gives you only boundary terms. So, so this is time evolution now. And I regard this parameter as another source. Um, and if you calculate the boundary symplectic pairing, then of course derivatives with respect to this parameter just bring down the Hamiltonian and you pair it with some other arbitrary variation, this lambda plus lambda minus variation. And because this is an imaginary source, um, this minus sign will turn into a plus sign in the anti-symmetrization. And what you get is just the total variation of the expectation value of the charge. So if you want to translate this uh, with the equality of the bugs uh, with the symplectic forms, you just get that uh, the variation of the charge is indeed um, given by pairing uh, the corresponding field transformation uh, with the bulk symplectic form. So this is just a check that this works. <coughs> you can apply this same game in the case of subregions. So we are in many cases interested in holography because of connection of, of the emergence of space-time with uh, quantum entanglement and these things. We are often interested in subregions and uh, 
reduce density matrices. So, so one thing that you can do is the same as before, but now you're not evolving with some conserved charge, but you're evolving with the modular Hamiltonian. So here in this case, the relative modular Hamiltonian of, um, of the state compared to the vacuum. Um, so, so these case are reduced density matrices to some subregion. And now I think about this modular time as uh, a complex source. So you can ask whether, you know, you can really turn this on with sourcing some simple operators. Uh, the answer is that uh, uh, we're basically assuming this, but you can imagine doing this uh, by, in terms of the replica trick, uh, because you can source a conical deficit in the metric. So, so that's what gives you powers of the density matrices. Uh, and if you, if you analytically continue this to some complex values, then you can imagine sourcing some change like this. But anyways, in, in this discussion, I will only need this for some very small value of this modular time. Um, so if, if you assume that this is another source, then the boundary symplectic pairing, just the same way as for the Hamiltonian, what it gives you is the variation of the expectation value of this evolution operator, which is nothing else than the relative entropy between uh, the reduced density matrix of this state with the sources compared to the vacuum. So because of this relation between the symplectic forms, then this must be equal to the symplectic flux in the Cauchy slice, where one of the variations is uh, given by the change of the bulk fields under modular flow. Okay, so, so this change in general is pretty hard to obtain. So the prescription again is that you determine how the sources change um, or how the waves change interchangeably um, in the boundary and then you solve it in with the linearized equations of motion. So, so this is very hard to do in general. But uh, so one thing that one can do here is that consider just bar shaped regions and states that are very close to the vacuum state so that there's no back reaction. So in this case, as I already mentioned at the beginning of the talk, you can treat these uh, path integral states as coherent states in bulk effective field theory. And if you do this and also use the equality of bulk and boundary modular flows, which is uh, something that is discussed in this GLMS paper, um, then one can derive that this change under the modular flow is just uh, some diffeomorphism acting on this difference of expectation values uh, of the bulk fields. So this diffeomorphism, what this is, is, uh, is Rindler time inside the Rindler wedge of this bar shaped region. And so, so this is well defined for the vacuum. Here you need this vacuum Rindler time. So at this level, you basically recover the equality between um, Fisher information and canonical energy, uh, which is something from Lashker and Ramsdong from a few years before. Um, so this kind of explains why this uh, symplectic form appears uh, so naturally in, in this expression. Okay, so now I'm going to move over to discuss the volume. So before I, um, so before I start discussing how to obtain the volume from the symplectic form, I want to just recall some um, things about some older uh, facts about the phase space in Einstein gravity, uh, which will be useful to understand this um, this transformation that is conjugate to the volume. Uh, okay, so basically, let, yeah. So let me begin. So the symplectic structure, uh, as before, is obtained by just taking the variation of uh, uh, of the on shell action and picking up the boundary term. So this way, in Einstein gravity, what you have is that uh, you have the induced metric on, um, on the boundary surface. So this will be the coordinate. If you, if you choose to put Dirichlet boundary conditions like this, when, when you don't change this in the boundary. And the conjugate variables uh, will be given by the extrinsic curvature tensor uh, via this formula. So this extrinsic curvature is has some standard way of being calculated from the normal vector of the surface. Um, so, so this is how one usually uh, does the initial data formalism in general relativity. Uh, but for our purposes, it's better to introduce some new variables. So, so you can introduce the conformal metric uh, and the scale. Uh, 
So the conformal metric will be basically this h bar, and you define it by multiplying out some power of the determinant. So this guy doesn't change under rescalings of the metric. And the other variable will be the determinant itself, of course. So this leads to uh, a new canonical, I mean, the, the canonical structure on these new variables will look like this. So there will be some conjugate variables to these coordinates. Um, and the conjugate to the volume density will be the trace of the extrinsic curvature, basically. And um, the conjugate to the conform metric will be the traceless part of the extrinsic curvature. So, okay, so the, the main point here is that to the volume density, the trace of the extrinsic curvature is the conjugate variable. Okay, so before moving on, of course, we know that uh, gravity is a gauge theory, so these phase space coordinates are not uh, completely independent. They must satisfy some constraints coming from gauge symmetry. So in general relativity, there are two different types of constraints. So there are d minus one momentum constraints, which are linear in the extrinsic curvatures. And these are very similar to Gauss's law uh, in an ordinary gauge theory. Uh, and you can just treat it in the same way uh, by some gauge fixing. And where these constraints come from are basically default morphisms um, inside the Cauchy slice. So, so they are really just gauge transformations of, uh, that, that do not change the Cauchy slice. So the second constraint is the Hamiltonian constraint. Um, so, so this is a, a little bit different. You, you don't see this kind of uh, constraint in an ordinary gauge theory. <laughs> Uh, because this is quadratic in in the extrinsic curvatures, um, and where this comes from, so so th this comes from different morphisms that move the Cauchy slice. So you don't have the analog of this in a normal gauge theory. You don't you cannot change the initial data slice with gauge transformations, but the difficulty in gravity that that you can do this. Uh, but there is a way of solving this constraint or gauge fixing this constraint, and this this has been proposed by York in a while back. So, so the way you do this is that you think about uh, when you separate the metric into uh, scale and conformal metric, you think about the scale as a scalar field and you just regard this equation as an equation for the scalar field that determines the scale in terms of the other variables. So this differential equation in a particular slicing uh, is known to uh, have unique solutions in flat space, and uh, if, if, if you have negative cosmological constant, this just helps with this uniqueness. So the point of this is that you can think about the volume density uh, as a functional of the remaining coordinates. So the conjugate to the volume, the traceless part of the extrinsic curvature, the conformal metric. So then what happens? So, so what happens with phase space? Uh, so the way to understand this is to go over to this nice slicing, which is called the uh, constant mean curvature slicing. So this, basically what you're doing is that you, you're slicing your space time in a way that each slice has constant trace of extrinsic curvature. And uh, because of this, this extrinsic curvature just parameterizes which slice you are on, so you can think about it as time. And the conjugate variable, in this case, uh, is just the integral of the scale factor, so the volume of the slice, and it will depend on the remaining variables. Um, so one of these guys is time, so this volume in this slicing uh, should be thought about uh, as a Hamiltonian. Uh, and this Hamiltonian, because it depends on the trace of the extrinsic curvature, um, is a time-dependent Hamiltonian. So if you solve the constraints uh, for for the Hamiltonian constraint, basically you end up with a system uh, with a time-dependent Hamiltonian. And uh, so, so one way to see that the volume is indeed the Hamiltonian is just to notice that even in classical mechanics, if you take a variation of the on-shell action in a way that you're not just varying the endpoint coordinates, but you're also varying the time of the endpoint, you get an extra term. And because of hamilton jacobis equation, you this extra term that couples to the variation of the time is just minus the Hamiltonian. And um, basically, that's why 
so so this this is what theta is in gr so in gr you also vary the the end time and that that's why you get the volume so a true gauge invariant symplectic form will be something that only couples the the gauge invariant initial data uh, and this only agrees with wild symplectic form if you enforce that you don't change the time which so this um, this york time okay so let me, after this little review, go back to discussing the volume. Um, so you can get the volume from the symplectic form in terms of these variables. If you switch one of the, the slots in this symplectic form to have zero variations for the gauge invariant initial data, the volume density, but you fix it to be a constant for York time. So for this trace of the extrinsic curvature, and in this case, if you pair it with an arbitrary variation, it's clear that the only guy that survives is the one that couples to this, which is the variation of the volume density. So you get the variation of the volume. So physically, this is like copying initial data from one York slice to, to, the, un, to the other. So you're not doing actual evolution. So this is not, not a diffeomorphism because you're not evolving these barred quantities. So in that case, you will just get a boundary term. Uh, but instead, you're not changing these guys, you're changing the time. Or equivalently, you could say that you don't change the time, but you only evolve with these guys. In that case, you're just uh, using this reduced symplectic form. Uh, and then it's just the statement that uh, the volume is conjugate uh, to time evolution. OK, and going in this way, when I just fix the variation of York time, is analogous to picking the Hamiltonian of a classical system from the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. So you can write, in terms of the normal induced metric and trace or extrinsic curvature, this variation, like translate it back to the original variables, and it will have some form. Um, yeah, so it basically looks like this. Uh, and one important comment here is that because this volume density is a function of the rest of the phase space variables. Um, you cannot independently fix its variation to be zero. So you need to check whether on, on which situations you can do this. And the way you check it is that you, you feed, check whether the Hamiltonian constraint is solved. Uh, and basically what you find that this is only uh, possible um, when the trace of the extrinsic curvature vanishes, which is the same condition that the slice is extrema. So, so this is for the background. So this trick, like picking the volume from the symplectic form, form it only works for extrema slices. Okay, so let me illustrate how this works in uh, a couple of examples. So, so the simplest example is just to think about perturbations of empty ADS. Um, so there is a particular nice set of coordinates on empty ADS. It's called the Wheeler-David coordinates, uh, which is basically realizing this constant mean curvature slicing that I have been talking about. So what this does, it in Lorentzian it foliates the Wheeler-David patch of a given slice, and this tau is like pushing this slice up or down in this diamond, uh, and the Euclidean discovers the entire boundary. And at i infinity and minus i infinity, you get either halves of the Euclidean manifold. And in this slicing, it's pretty easy to see because so, so this this d sigma here it, it doesn't depend on tau. It's just the the geometry of the t equals zero slice. Uh, so because of this, it's easy to see that the conform the derivative of the conformal metric uh, with respect to tau is just zero because you don't have this cost factor here. And it's also true for the trace less part of the extrinsic curvature. And also at the maximal slice, of course, the volume density is extrema too. So the derivative is zero here too. So because of this, in the special case of the vacuum, uh, this York transformation, uh, which I described in the previous slide, uh, is really just a diffeomorphism. It's evolution in this York time. This is not true in general, but for the vacuum it is true. But because it's a diffeomorphism, we see that any variation of the volume 
uh, around the vacuum is a boundary term. Okay, so just having that the variation of the volume is a boundary term is not, uh, I mean, it, it could still be non-trivial, uh, but because this York time moves us inside the Wheeler David patch, so, so this is what it does in Lorentzian, seems like it doesn't move the boundary slice, right? So that's how it is uh, constructed. Um, so it seems like that this boundary term must be trivial. Uh, so this is not entirely true because in ADS-CFT we need to cut off the geometry. Um, so, so there will be some cutoff effects here, uh, but, but it entirely comes from the IR cutoff in the bulk, so it must be related to some UV physics in the, in the boundary. And indeed, so you can just calculate using Euclidean HKLL, like with brute force, uh, how this variation of the volume looks like to arbitrary changes in the boundary induced metric. Uh, and you get an expression where you basically integrate some, like the variation of this boundary induced metric only uh, at the t equals zero slice. And so one important feature here is that this is divergent, so there's some dimension dependent. So, so this is the cutoff, this epsilon. And there's no finite piece. So this is not like the leading order piece in some expansion. Uh, this is the li linearly exact result. So there's no finite or subleading pieces. Um, and in particular, if you, if you want to think about some nice states in this space of variations, then as I mentioned, you should imagine switching off this variation near the t equals zero slice. So in that case, this variation seems to be zero. Okay, um, so let's see how we interpret this deformation in the boundary. So now we want to push it to the Euclidean boundary. So because it's a diffeomorphism, it's easy to do. So you just analytically continue this evolution in the arc time to, to Euclidean. And here I've written it in standard Poincaré coordinates. <clears throat> and the way this looks like when, uh, when you push it to the boundary, so where you take the Pfeffermann Graham coordinate to be epsilon, and you assume that the time is much bigger than this, then you can forget about this term and you get a, a rescaling of the radial coordinate uh, with a sine function. So this means that you're doing a wire transformation with, with a sine function. So that's what this deformation is. But of course, this is only true if you're away from the t equals zero surface, much further away than the cutoff. If, if, if you're getting close to the cutoff, then there's some particular way via the square roots that the bulk regularizes this sign. Um, but this regularization, it's, it's not very natural from the boundary point of view. So for the boundary symplectic form, you would imagine that the way you would regularize this sign is that, let's say you switch off the sources in some buffer zone around the t equals zero surface. And if you do this, then the boundary just automatically gives you zero. The reason for this is that these well transformations will give you the variation of the trace of the stress tensor. And you always, so, so this is a local anomaly. And uh, you always integrate this on the opposite side compared to where you take the variation. So if this one point function was non-locally determined, then this could be non-zero. So then you, you could have an effect by varying a one point, like sources on one side and the one point function could change on the other side, but because this is a local anomaly, this never happens. Okay, so in both cases, if you restrict to some nice states, you, you get zero. Um, but the, the way that the bulk regulates this uh, sign is not like particularly clear to us from a boundary point of view. Okay, so how, how am I doing with time? Okay, so I have like uh, 15 minutes. Yeah, about 15 minutes. Yeah, okay, so let me just keep this slide. Um, okay, and move on to discuss the term of the double. Um, so another simple example where you can work out this transformation that is conjugate to the volume is the term of the double at infinite time. So, so here is the top part of the Penrose diagram and the, the interesting thing about the term of your double is that the maximal slice that is anchored at infinite times at both sides is not the singularity, but instead something that stays 
away from the singularity. So it's some nice slice. And if you can pick some nice coordinates in the interior, which is this blue region, and in these coordinates, uh, so, so this kappa will be a time-like coordinate, which is outside some space-like coordinate. Um, and this final slice is just at a constant value of this kappa. And another nice thing about these coordinates here, so, so this is some generalization of what uh, is used in hartmann malda Sena um, for arbitrary dimensions. And this is uh, the constant mean curvature slicing of this interior. So you can think about this interior as the wheeler david patch of the infinite time slice. Okay, so constant kappa slices are constant mean curvature slices. Okay, so now we're looking for this transformation that is conjugate to the volume. And it turns out that for this slice, um, you can again achieve it. Uh, by doing a diffeomorphism, but it's a little bit different than for the vacuum because you're not just doing an evolution in in this York time, so it's not it's not trivial, completely trivial at the boundary, because uh, if you just do this, you have some evolution of the the unconstrained phase space variables, but it turns out that you can undo this evolution by a diffeomorphism that's completely inside the slice. So you need to complement this with some change of the boundary time and the, the space coordinates. Okay, so, so this way there's a non-trivial action. Um, okay, so how do we read the boundary diffeomorphism that you need to do? It's actually not completely a diffeomorphism that you need to do in the boundary because there's this shifting kappa. Uh, and so, so the way you continue from this metric um, the way you get to the exterior by this metric is by an analytic continuation. So you can get to the exterior region by analytically continuing uh, um, the interior time. Uh, so this leads you to the Lorentzian exterior. Um, and that can eventually continue to completely Euclidean geometry if, uh, if you continue the time along the t equals zero slice. But you think about you want to think about um, about this Euclidean path integral really as a time fold that prepares these states. So so you prepare the term of your double at t equals zero as you usually do by uh, path integral on the half cylinder. And then you do a turn into Lorentzian time and you do the time fold integral like half of the schwinger kaldish contour. Um, so on this boundary, basically, you can read off the deformation by just sending this uh, row to infinity, which means that you send kappa to i infinity. And what you end up with is that you will have a, a shift in the radial coordinate, which will amount to um, a change in the well factor, the conformal class of the metric, or, or the conform conformal structure of the metric. So that will be an imaginary change. Uh, and for the boundary time, and um, and spatial coordinates, you just get the same diffeomorphism that that you had on this slice. Okay, so so here's a simple deformation, and uh, there's a couple of simple checks that you can run on it. Uh, so so we know how the volume goes at late times, at very late times. It's it has some linear growth. Uh, so this is the bulk formula, and you can reproduce some simple variations of this um, from a boundary calculation. Uh, so, so some very simple things that you have access to are uh, like the beta derivative of this. Um, so with respect to the temperature and the time derivative of this, and you can do a, get this from a boundary calculation by following this transformation formula for, uh, for the boundary. Okay, so now let me move on to discuss um, how this story might connect to the complexity equals volume conjecture. So the story that I told you so far is that uh, you can write the variation of the volume as a symplectic pairing between the variation and the, something that is conjugate to the volume. Uh, and this transformation we understand from the bulk. So it's like half of a York evolution. Uh, but we don't really understand it from the boundary point of view. And the question is, does it have some nice natural boundary interpretation? And so one thing that you can come up with is that 
it's anyways because there is this geometry on these sources it's natural to think about uh, various various geometric notions like a distance between points uh, so so here's a distance functional so this is not the usual geometric uh, or um, yeah, so this is not the usual diffeomorphism invariant uh, distance functional, but instead the kinetic energy, but this gives you the same geodesics. Um, and this metric is just the Kähler metric. So just to remind you, the Kähler metric is the symmetric variation uh, of the partition function. Um, so the variation of this distance along a geodesic uh, will be a boundary term. So because this guy is on shell and this boundary term will be a pairing between um, your variation at the end point and the tangent vector to this geodesic. And the pairing happens with the Kähler metric. So, so this is very similar to this formula that you have for the volume. Uh, because for the volume, you have a symplectic pairing. But because we're, we know that we're in a Kähler manifold, you can just write it with this with the Kähler metric by putting the complex structure in one of the slots. So this is a very similar looking formula. So one possible conjecture that you can make for the boundary interpretation of this York deformation is that if you act with the complex structure, so you kind of remove the sign of factor, uh, then you get the tangent factor to a geodesic in source space. So if this is true, then complexity as defined by this kinetic energy um, is the same as the volume of the extremal slice. Okay, so, so this, this is one way to, um, you know, like suggest a boundary uh, interpretation for this variation. Uh, but I, I, want, I don't have like a better fundamental reason beyond like what, uh, what uh, is said by Sask than others why um, why something that knows about the history of state uh, should be dual to the volume um, so so this might not be true but uh, what I will continue with is to to show you some examples where it seems to work reasonably well so so before I do this so, so let me make some additional comments so I was talking about this distance in source space, but if I want this to be a function of only a single state, then I need to fix a reference state. And a reference state obviously satisfies that uh, around the reference state, the variation of this function is zero because it's a positive function and it's zero only at the reference state. And I want to remind you that uh, around the vacuum, uh, the volume is a pure divergence and for nice variations, it actually vanishes. Um, so, so therefore, we will think about the vacuum as a reference state. Uh, the, the other comment is that, uh, as I said, we are using this kinetic energy instead of, let's say, the square root of it, which would be like a natural reparameterization invariant distance. Uh, and the reason to do this is that this is the only function of, um, of this velocity square that has the right additivity properties. So you expect both the both any kind of good notion of complexity to be additive um, when you just add non-interacting subsystems and also for the volume you imagine that if you have like disconnected universes then the volumes add up um, and this scalar metric um, it comes from you know for independent sus subsystems the partition function is just the product of partition functions so the scalar metric is additive under the same operation so you better have a functional that is linear in this G. So this basically fixes this kinetic energy. Um, and yeah, so the last comment is that because you do this, you also break reparameterization invariance. So it's not enough to specify the end state. You also need to specify a velocity that you use to go through this geodesic. Um, and this is something that we are not completely sure how to fix. Okay, so let me give you uh, the main example, which seems to work. So, so this is uh, Banyados geometries. So Banyados geometries are dual to states in a 2D CFT that are created from the vacuum by a small local conformal transformation. So in terms of light concoordinates, you're, you're doing some, uh, some local conformal transformation. And the way these states look like is that you act with uh, 
some unitary operators um, on the vacuum, and th these are basically uh, some representations of the conformal group. And we will work perturbatively in the size of this conformal transformation. So this will th this is uh, parameterized by this sigma, and uh, if the sigma is small, then this operator basically looks like uh, some exponential of the stress tensor, um, and it will be convenient to write it instead of the functions that parameterize the the change of light concoordinates as uh, functions that couple to tt and tx components. So, so these functions are these combinations, and basically the meaning is that this tf is if you do this coordinate transformation, uh, is this is the new shape of the t equals zero slice, and this x is the longitudinal shift along this. Um, along this slice. Okay, so the killer potential, as I said, is the log of the overlap. So if I have a unitary transformation, this would be, of course, one, and this is trivial, but as I said, you need to complexify sources. So, so this is why this becomes non-trivial, but it's not very clear, like in terms of these Gs, what you need to do, like how you complexify sources. So the most naive thing would be to complexify these functions simply. But this seems to be too much because, as I said, in terms of sources, the the background geometry that uh, that 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 is specified by these sources has to be invariant under this uh, flip plus complex conjugation symmetry. But this G plus and G minus determines the entire background metric. Uh, so if I just complexify both, I just get some generic complex source. So I need to restrict to these symmetric configurations. And the way you do this is just to require this metric that, that you use to source this transformation to be invariant this Z2 plus C in Euclidean. And what this gives you is that one of these functions, this X of F, uh, needs to be real. So it's the same as its complex conjugate. So the prescription then to calculate this scalar potential is to keep the XF function real and complexify the T function. So if you do this, then, then you get some killer potential that looks like this. So, so this factor is really just the stress tensor two-point function. So it's the leading order contribution just comes from the, the vacuum two-point function of the stress tensor. And uh, you get the imaginary parts of, of this function. So from if you take the anti or the symmetrized variation, then you get some killer metric, which is quadratic. And because of this, you get geodesics that are straight lines. So this order, the geodesics are just straight lines. So, so this is this formula here. So this is the final point of the geodesic. And when you reach with the parameter SF, you just go from zero to this thing here. So you feed this back, you get some formula for, for this distance, which reads like this. OK, and the nice thing is that uh, in these Banyados geometries, the change in the extremal volume to second order in the deformation was calculated pretty recently by Florian Mikli. Uh, and the formula is basically the same as just a, as what I give gave. Um, so because of this, this distance in this states to this order agrees with uh, with the change in the volume. Okay, so another example that can be studied is, um, is of course, all this discussion is um, one of the main motivations is the time of- I have a, I have a question about the previous slide. Uh, sure. so, so, so the thing that you were, the thing that you were doing was to look at states that were obtained by applying a unitary transformation on the vacuum. Uh-huh. Okay. okay, okay, okay. So, so the vacuum was a, so just to make sure the vacuum was a reference state and the target state was, uh, well, unitary times, times uh, the vacuum. Yeah, that's right. At least in this formula. But I, yeah, so, so this previous formula, if, if you complexify this T, yeah. then you're not necessarily doing a unitary. So that spoils it being a unitary. But yes, yeah, so, so you're basically analytically continuing from, from some unitary transformation. And the target state is, is the one that you get by conformal transformation and the reference state is the vacuum itself. Okay, thanks. Yeah, this one's double check. Thank you. Okay. So another interesting thing to look at is the time evolution of the thermophile double. And 
in this case, so for the time level of term of UW, um, you can like check how this um, notion of distance works in a mini superspace ap approximation. So mini su this is mini superspace uh, because we will restrict to some constant submanifold of stress tensor sources, source deformations that you can do of this state, and this subspace will be just uh, basically complexified time. So you, you're sourcing the Hamiltonian as a conserved charge, you complexify this time and this will be your source. So we're looking at geodesics in a two-dimensional space. And if you do this, uh, the KLR metric is just given by the double variation of, um, of the partition function as before. And of course, doing this restriction, you, you can actually calculate this so you don't need the partition function for any background metric is just coming from some analytic continuation of the thermal partition function. Um, and for CFTs that live on the plane, this is just fixed by dimensional analysis, how log of Z depends on beta. Okay, so if you fix some coordinates on this 2D space in a way, so, so I'm not going to use tau, but instead uh, I, I incorporate like this beta that I have here to the real part of this coordinate. Um, so I separate it into real and imaginary part. Uh, then this functional, like this distance functional looks like this. So it's some simple problem that then you can solve. And the boundary conditions are that you go from temperature beta basically. Um, so both in the initial and final state and you go from t equals zero to t equals some time. Okay. And Okay, so the way we will fix um, this SF now um, is, okay, so you, 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 you could imagine doing a number of things, but uh, one thing that seems to be natural based on um, uh, discussions of complexity in the term of field double is that the boundary time is, is related to Rindler time. So because of this, we, we fix the velocity, the magnitude of the velocity to be some constant, which only determined via dimensional analysis from the temperature. And basically what this tells you is that you're, you're going through, um, so the temperature determines how fast you're going through the geodesic. Okay, so this gives you, sets you up the problem and you can solve for the geodesics. And basically what you get is, um, is that at late times, it's easy to see that the, like the way this thing grows is linear and the coefficient is the mass. Of course, like the order one coefficient is not fixed here. Um, but before that time, you can get actually some non-trivial dynamics. So the solution is given by some hypergeometric functions and the derivative looks like this. So it starts linear and then saturates to this late time value. Actually, this is not just a simple saturation, but there's actually a phase transition in the solution. So this, from, after some time, each of these solution becomes uh, a constant for the derivative. Um, okay, but it's kind of like a second order one, so the derivatives match up. Okay, so how does this compare to the volume? So the volume in the term of your double, like visually look, does something similar. So there's some um, linear start in the derivative and then there's a saturation. Um, so, so the way you can compare is that because of course we're not fixing the overall coefficient is that we fix the late time growths to be the same. And in that case, you can compare the initial growths, like the early time behavior. And uh, here's how like a normalized out early time behavior looks for this function. And here is what it looks for the volume. So they are of course not the same. Uh, but one thing that is encouraging is that uh, this thing is always larger than the volume itself. So the reason why this, that is encouraging because uh, we're doing a mini super space approximation to a geodesic in a positive definite metric, which means that you know, that, that's still like a valid curve in the space of sources, um, but uh, it must be longer than the actual geodesic. So if, you know, if, if, if this guy was whenever smaller than this guy, then there would be no chance that the actual geodesic would agree with the volume, but this way, this seems to be consistent. Okay, um, and basically this is what I wanted to talk about or all I wanted to say, I just want to note uh, that uh, like a very few list of uh, puzzles. Um, 
Okay, so, so one conclusion is that I think uh, looking at these distance functionals in this geometry is a natural thing, and there is some evidence that uh, the volume of the extremal slice uh, seems to be related to, uh, to some geometric notions or some geodesics in this space. Um, so, so one puzzle is that how to fix this SF. So, so one thing that I was maybe not very explicit about is that we fix it differently for Banyadas geometries and for the thermofield double. Um, so it's not clear what is the principle, like the, the really good principle to fix this. And of course, uh, like whether all this is true. So it would be interesting to, you know, gain evidence whether this, uh, so, so what is, what is in general, the boundary understanding of this deformation that is conjugate to the volume. Um, is it true that it is related to su such tangent vectors? And if, if it's true, can, can we prove this in general? Um, yeah, and thank you. Thanks. Any questions? So I have a quick question about the, the lack of reparameterization variance. So, um, in, in several papers uh, on complexity uh, in, in field theory or in, in quantum mechanics, uh, we look also at these L1 norms. Mm -hmm. So if you use L1 norm, then uh, I think you, you don't get this problem, but of course the, the, ge the notion of the geometry changes, right? It's, it's, it's not really the, the, the reminding reality. So have you, mm -hmm. do, do you have something to, to comment about this? Like, have you looked into this? Yeah, so of course you can try a lot of uh, different things, I guess, uh, playing with this geometry, but one thing that seems to be, so, so another reason why doing this kinetic energy seems to be natural um, is, yeah, so basically this relation. So if, 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 if you have some other functional that let's say has some absolute value, uh, then here the tangent vector will depend nonlinearly on on the on the metric at the end point and that's that's something that we don't really expect for this york deformation um yeah so so beyond this uh i, I don't have too many extra comments one question is that so for, with the l1 norm um so, so this is a question from me i guess so with the l1 warm norm do you have the additivity property so is, is it true that um, um. Not clear. Uh, the reason being that the L1 norm is basis dependent, uh, mm -hmm. which uh, I would say that there exists a basis in which there is this property. Uh -huh. There are many others in which it, it doesn't. So, so, so these things are are discussed to to some extent in this paper on complexity of thermofield double states without uh, in October. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested, like uh, like you can do it there. Yeah, of course, of course, I will take a look. So in particular, I like uh, what we do there is like uh, a little bit dumb in the sense that we, we just take three bosons and calculate, I mean, calculate the complexity of chemical double states. And uh, for L1 norm, we are not really able to, to minimize the problem. Uh, I mean, I could find the, the, the minimum, but what mm -hmm. we do is we calculate the, we calculate the geodesic for, for the L2 norm. And then mm -hmm. how we land on this geodesic for the, using the L1 norm. And mm -hmm. then like there is a choice of basis uh, for this L1 norm for, for the generators. And so for the kind of vectors such that, uh, for example, when you calculate the complexity of formation, the, the, the complexity of back to on actually cancels and what you left with is like uh, this thermodynamic entropy. Mm -hmm. So th this is at t equals zero, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, this is the discussion at equal zero. Yeah. Yeah. And also, like when we are looking at the, so, so, so this is something that I don't see it here yet. I mean, in 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 the in the story that that you've been developing, this is the story of uh, like complexity starting from some spatially disentangled uh, reference state. So when we're when we try to define complexity in computing with the first. In the first place, 
what we what we realized that if you want to match the what the volume of uh, the maximum volume slice in in, in ADS in anti ADS right then what we need to do is we have to take as a reference state spatially with a final state so like there was like one ingredient that we have to have and the other one is that in order to calculate the the length of the geodesic we have to use the, the L1 norm and I mean I mean the scanner that led to the result that that, that was satisfactory. Yeah, of course. I mean, here we're not using, uh, so, so the motivate, so, so we're kind of working from the bulk, right? So the right, motivation right. is not really gate counting. And in the case of these, um, these Euclidean path integral states, it's not clear how to define some good disentangled state. So, so these, th th that wouldn't be like a nice classical state. No and, um, so, so the reason why we fix this to be a reference state, the vacuum is, is really that this observation that for the volume, um, so apart from UV divergences, uh, any variation of the volume around the vacuum just vanishes in any dimension. Oh, okay. So it really, the, the bulk kind of tells you that, you know, in, in some sense, the, the vacuum still seems to be a good reference state in, in case you, you're interested in finite quantities. No, that, that's absolutely correct. Like, but, okay, one thing that, 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 that at least myself, I would love to understand is to, I mean, assuming that, that holographic complexity proposals are actually about complexity, right? Um, how to calculate, say, um, a complexity of a state containing some, some number of gravitons, right? Say, uh, MPVS with uh, gravitational weight uh, with respect to, you know, with respect to the, to, to the vacuum, like really mm -hmm. setting the, the vacuum as a reference state, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you if you just want classical gravitational waves, then uh, I mean, because what what you, what you did here, to as far as I understood, maybe I misunderstood you, was to calculate the change in complexity, right? And you yeah, I mean, it, it depends how you call it. So I mean, this this is not some very conventional notion of complexity, but it seems to be like related to these Fubini study notions. Yeah. But yeah, so this is like um, the the change in this distance functional or this kinetic energy on, yeah. on this space yeah okay. so if you if you want to say then yeah it's a change in the complexity but yeah, so, so in this notion probably you can just do some calculate so for classical waves you you should be able to easily do a calculation for quantum corrections so, so this is all like leading order in large n. so if you want to talk about order one sources which are quantum then, then, then you probably need to to a little bit understand a couple of more things here. One, one more question. So, 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 do you have something to say about actions, or like uh, it's completely beyond the scope? So, you mean like complexity equals action type yeah. of thing? Yes. No, yes. not really. Yeah. So, this really grew out from this. Um, so, so we were interested in these overlaps and then realized the, that the symplectic form is something that, that maps to some simple stuff in the boundary. Um, and then because it's uh, in the bulk, it picks up integrals on co-dimension one slices, then those are the things that we have access to. So it's not, not really clear how to, how, how to get integrals that are co-dimension co zero. We haven't thought about it too much. Uh, okay, thanks. Any questions from our um, online audience? If not, then let's thank uh, Gabor again. Thank you.